welcome everybody. Um, this is the first in the 2024 NEST uh, Distinguished Lectures, and we're very pleased to see so many people here, and I'm going to turn it over to Valerie for the introduction. Hi, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Professor Valerie Osterveld. I'm a professor at the Faculty of Law, but I'm also the acting director of the Center for Transitional Justice and Post-Conflict Reconstruction here in the NEST. So I'm going to start off with a land acknowledgement, and then I'll introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Dancy. Um, and the, we're going to get coffee. It's literally arriving right now. So when I'm stall, done, stall. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I'm done all that, just feel free to get up and or while I'm doing it, get up and get a coffee if you would like. All right. So I'll start off by uh, the land, with the land acknowledgement. So. At Western University, our land acknowledgement strives to rise above mere words and instead seeks to inspire action and commitment towards recognizing and furthering our relationships with Indigenous peoples. And you all know that across the country, land acknowledgements have become very common. Uh, sometimes they become very rote, but we all need to pay attention to ensure that they are not something that's rote. And they're often said at the beginning of a public gathering just like this. So I think it's really important to realize and to uh, recognize, of course, that land acknowledgments are an effort to pay respect to the original people who live on this very physical territory on which Western University sits. So I acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and the Lenoi and Adirondack uh, peoples on lands that are connected with the London Township and Songbird Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. Now, I'm a professor of international law. That includes treaties that are nation to nation. And these two treaties, these two covenants, make me think a lot about the relationship of the nations that lived here prior to contact, and I respect the long-standing relationships that Indigenous peoples, and these particular Indigenous peoples in this region, have to this land as the original caretakers and the river that runs through London. As well, the Center for Transitional Justice and Post-Conflict Reconstruction, which sits within the nest, is a place of study of the historical and ongoing injustices against Indigenous peoples in Canada, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, and what they have endured, what they are enduring, and acknowledging those injustices. And we accept responsibility as a center and as a university to contribute towards revealing and correcting the miseducation that's happened in the past, as well as renewing respectful relationships with Indigenous communities through our teaching, research, and community service. And by that, I mean all Indigenous peoples around the world, because we have many people in the Center for Transitional Justice working on issues with respect to Indigenous peoples in many other countries around the world as well. I'd like to turn now to introducing our distinguished speaker, Dr. Jeff Dancy, who is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. He studies international human rights, international criminal law, and political violence. Through, though his primary expertise is in the evaluation of accountability um, through institutions like criminal tribunals and truth commissions. He is the director of a Global Affairs Canada sponsored project called Transitional Justice Evaluation Tools, which I think he might mention as part of your talk, or maybe in the Q&A, if he doesn't, ask him about it in the Q&A, which collects and analyzes data on states' efforts to pursue accountability for human rights violations. You might have, if you're a student, have read Professor Dancy's work, because he's been published in the American Political Science Review, International Organization, and the, the journal that's at the pinnacle of international law, the American Journal of International Law, amongst others. He's a former director of the Transitional Justice Research Collaborative. He has, for over 15, he has over 15 years of experience collecting and analyzing data on transitional justice including doing field work in Northern Ireland, Israel, Sri Lanka, Kenya, and Colombia. He holds an MA in, in 
International Relations from the University of North Texas, and a PhD in International Relations from the University of Minnesota. So please join me in welcoming Professor Dancy. Thank you, Valerie, very much. And thank you all for having me. This is, uh, this is fun. I'm glad to be here. This, this is a good full room. I should say that I know that some of you have to leave at 3 p.m., uh, and that's okay. And if uh, I'm planning to speak for 45 minutes, but it might work better if it's interactive, especially for some of you that have questions that come up during the presentation. I don't care if there's an exchange during the talk. That doesn't bother me at all. So if there's something that's like a real itch that you need scratch, just uh, let me know. Um, especially when we get to some of the heavy lifting that I'll, you know, I'll present in, in, in the simplest terms possible, but about like things like measuring Google search rates and stuff like that. You might want to know more as we're going through it, and that's fine. So just uh, shout it out. Uh, this is a project uh, that I'm working on with uh, a, a person that I met as an undergraduate at, in Denton, Texas, and he's now at the University of Michigan, and I'm at the University of Toronto. Um, he's also a political scientist. His name is Chris Ferris. Uh, he's an expert in measurement, um, and I am. And he, but he also works on human rights. So one of the things that he's done is uh, measure human rights violations using all data available on human rights violations in a way that's meant to be more accurate than any other uh, than any other data source. And um, and and this is a kind of something that emerged because I there are all these books that were coming out about human rights and its failure, the future, which I'll talk about in a second. And I said, I think I, I have an idea that's kind of weird and crazy. Do you want to come down to New Orleans for a weekend and talk about it? I was in New Orleans at the time. He came down, and I presented the idea to him at a coffee shop. I was like, I think we can measure the resonance of human rights around the world using Google data. And he was like, no. <laughs> he just said, no, you can't. And I was like, OK, well, we have three more days. So I'll spend one day trying to convince you, and then two days of hashing out. And I started working on it, and he said, you know, I'm looking at it. I think, I think you might be right. And so it, was, it started as a harebrained idea, and it became more concrete over time. And it's part of what might end up being a book project. But so far, um, it's informed these two articles. One is the global resonance of human rights, what Google Trends can tell us uh, in a political science journal. And then this on open global rights, which is called Human Rights Are Still in Demand, which is the 1,000-word version of the article. So that's what I'll be talking about today. It all stemmed from a growing unease that we both had um, about work that was coming out considering the future of human rights. So this is the central orienting question at the beginning around which the project revolves, which is, what does the future hold? Um, we were being told throughout the 2000 teens that the future of human rights was bleak. Um, in the future turn, which might you might have seen volumes that are that have the future the future of human rights third edition, you know, Upendra Boxy. Uh, human rights future is edited by Stephen Hopkins, Jack Snyder, and Leslie Venturi. The future of human rights by Alison Brisk. What is what are they saying in these future books? Right? Um, they're saying, I think, in in many cases, what journalists are saying, which is that uh, President Trump and other populists, if that's what we want to call them are a, a real danger for the future of human rights. We're at a high risk moment, right? Um, the, the, what does it mean to be human in a global digital age? Well, it's not as encouraging, right? Uh, where humans are being, or and human rights are being pushed out in the age of algorithms. And then have human rights failed? I don't even exactly know how human rights could fail, but uh, more specifically, some people say how to, has human rights law failed? Right? And this is a question that keeps coming up over and over in journalism and in scholarship. Um, so our first proposition is that the future turn uh, in scholarship and otherwise is really about how we understand the current state of human rights. This is about people's perspectives of what's going on right now. Right? Um, and in fact, what's happening right now is that Politically speaking, there might be something like an erasure of the future. Uh, people on the left are so worried about climate change that they think we need radical action because there is no future. We're going to die a heat death soon, right? So we've got to, uh, and and I worry about that too. And but we've got to take drastic and more radical action now. And people on the right say that there's no future if we allow 
foreigners to come into our country and, and destroy it from within, right? This is uh, really popular rhetoric in the United States and across Europe. And so uh, there, there are commentators that talk about the erasure of the future and how that's happening in political discourse. Uh, meanwhile, we have folks talking about the future of human rights also not being there. Uh, we, we're, there is no future. The human rights are falling apart. The whole edifice that was constructed after uh, the after World War II is decrepit, right, and will collapse. So, uh, what they're talking about is what they see happening now. What is happening now? And we have basically two perspectives on this: that the human rights edifice of law and institutions and activism is no longer doing any good. So you can see that in Stephen Hopkins' work, The End Times of Human Rights. Eric Posner's The Twilight of Human Rights Law, and then Sam Moyne's Human Rights in an Unequal World, which is titled, Not Enough. Human rights are not enough to address the real challenges that we face uh, with regard to inequality um, and, and the promotion of equitable democratic governance. So you can see uh, from the specific quotations, people like Stephen Hopkins say, for the thing most likely to stall human rights progress, is people around the world simply not considering them to be as important as their advocates would have us believe. This is an empirical prediction, or it's a claim about what's happening in the world right now, which is that people are starting to care less about human rights. The discourse, the words that we use, the vocabulary of human rights is not reaching regular people. That's the central claim of Stephen Hopkins' book. On the other side, though, you have people that have kind of a, I, I hesitate to say rosier picture, but a more positive outlook on the current state, which is that human rights have succeeded in some instances at least. And the world is better for having human rights law and human rights activism than it would be otherwise. That's a counterfactual. The counterfactual world without human rights would be worse. And that you can see in Beth Simmons' is Mobilizing for Human Rights, R.A. Nyer's The International Human Rights Movement, and Catherine Sicking's Evidence for Hope. In R.A. Nyer's book, he says, I see a growing, a growing global human rights movement made up of thousands of organizations. While they suffer many defeats, they also help to constrain abuses committed by authoritarian and despotic states. So where Hopgood, in the same year, sees a drying up, a shriveling, Right? Uh, and, and less use and less resonance of the discourse, R.E.A. Nyer sees a growing commitment to human rights. And that makes sense. He's a, himself a human rights advocate. Right? That was a, a, a key figure in Human Rights Watch and its de development over time. So our second proposition as political scientists is that we actually don't really know how people reach these conclusions in their work. How do they draw these inferences? How, what evidence are they looking at to make these huge claims that people are not, don't care about human rights as much anymore or that interest is growing? What are Ari and I and Stephen Hopgood looking at? Right? Do, they have a, do they have a regular feed that tells them what's happening in the world or are they making guesses? Uh, so most of what people do is they look on what we call the, and forgive the economic metaphor, but the supply side. What are human rights organizations doing? And organizations that produce information, what does that information look like? And so this is very kind of top-down looking. It's what are what are what is Amnesty International up to? What is Human Rights Watch up to? Uh, what is the International Center for Transitional Justice doing? Where are they operating in the world? What reports are being produced? How are those reports being received? Um, and that all filters into this kind of professionalized discourse of human rights, which you can find on like human rights careers, right? This is that the, the transnational advocacy uh, professionalism that's taken place over the last 30 years. And we orient ourselves towards international and transnational non-governmental organizations. And we view them to be, uh, and, and their activities to be kind of a bellwether for what's happening in human rights as a whole. But is that the best approach? Our third proposition is that based on this supply side information that folks have, like Hopgood and others, they presume knowledge about the demand side of human rights. 
They presume to know what ordinary people think about human rights or why they choose to adopt human rights as a claim making grammar. Okay, but the supply side doesn't really tell us about that. It doesn't tell us about what we call discursive resonance. So are people still mobilizing around the language of human rights? Do they continue to care about human rights? And what does that tell us about the now and the future of human rights? Those are the things that we're trying to address. And that was what the original idea was. How do we study human rights resonance? So to do this, to study human rights resonance, it requires that we observe human rights in time and space. We've got to know what things look like now, and, and we've got to know how things, how, how resonant the discourse is in different places and in different time periods. To, to draw these inferences about progress or decline, writ large, or about the use or disuse of the language. Okay? So time-wise, we're interested in, do, is the human rights discourse actually losing its resonance globally? Is this an accurate statement to make? And then second, why do some populations show an interest in human rights while others don't? That's the spatial dimension. Why are some populations in some countries really interested in human rights, and why are they not interested in other places? How, how, do we know, how do we know where to expect people to mobilize the discourse? What do we know about this stuff? What do we know about human rights in time and space? In time, we know a little bit. So in Sam Moyne's book, The Last Utopia, Human Rights in History, I'm convinced, by the way. Has everybody read this book, or are you familiar with it at all? It was very provocative. From, he's a historian and an intellectual historian, but he claims that, um, that human rights really emerged as a subject of interest in the 1970s and that it's falling off. And that it's a twin, um, a handmaiden to neoliberalism. Okay, so that's, those are the kind of the central claims of this book. But I think that he got the idea for the book from this chart that he buried in an appendix. So he doesn't even show it in the book. But it's Human Rights in Anglo-American News from 1785. I don't even know where you get that, those data. To 1985. And what do we see? That there's a huge spike in the talk of human rights around 1977. And on this basis, he argues that human rights were pretty much not important globally until the late 70s. That's a central thesis of this work of history. And I think... It came from this one chart that he made, right? But it does tell us something that maybe human rights did break through in the 1970s. And then this chart ends in 1985. We don't really know what happens after, right? This is written information by journalists, okay? So just keep that in mind. This is the bit that's at the center of all of Sam Moyne's breakthrough book. Um, we know now because we can use other tools that Google provides, Ingrams Viewer, for example, which is all, it, it's a catalog of all digitized written information, mostly books, over, over the last 200 years. Human rights began its ascent in, at first in the 1940s, and then it trails off, and then this is actually the 1960s, okay? And written information about human rights starts to ascend in the 1960s, and then goes up and up and up and up where it continues today. But this ends around 2000, this particular chart. So this is interesting by itself because it, in a way, works against Sam Moyne's thesis. He argues that decolonization wasn't a human rights movement. And Stephen Jensen and I think that he's wrong about that. Right? Uh, that, in fact, uh, decolonization is what introduced the first human rights treaties to the world. Um, and was very much couched in the language of human rights. Um, but this is a historical argument that might not interest us that much. It doesn't tell us about the now. It just tells us about the trajectory of the language over time. And we know that it was starting to bubble up in the 40s, and then it took a hiatus, or it just plateaued, and then started again in the mid-60s onto today. But this is just what's written in books. We don't, it's what scholars have documented, historians and journalists. It's not really what, it's not the language of ordinary people, right? So if our claim is that ordinary people don't find 
human rights to be particularly useful and they're not interested anymore. This doesn't really tell us about that. Space, what do we know? Well, Gordon and Berkovich, it, uh, in an article of political studies, tell us very little research is focused on how a human rights discourse surfaces in the domestic sphere. And they're right about that. We don't have a lot of comparative evidence about why some countries' populations mobilize around human rights in moments of time and whether they sustain that and, and, place it, and people in other countries don't. We just, we just don't have a great deal of evidence. And so to do this kind of work and to come up with our own comparative theories, we kind of had to grope around for different ideas that speculate as to why human rights discourse becomes popular in some places and not in others. And so we drew on history, legal anthropology, political economy, and theories of social movements for this. And this will come to roost in a minute when I talk about our, our two basic theories, but we, we tried to read widely to see what people say about the emergence of rights, or where rights really make an imprint, and why. And there's some really good works on this. I think Lynn Hunt's Inventing Human Rights is interesting for the whole his, historical landscape of where rights language becomes uh, more used. Uh, legal anthropology, you have a book called Prisoners of Freedom, Human Rights in the African Port, that argues that human rights is very much an outsider discourse that fits uneasily with local political movements in certain places. Uh, this is work of legal anthropology. And then on the other side, you have Sally Mary, who argues that it gets vernacularized by local political movements. Um, political economy work, we know that from the uh, modernization literature, there's, and it's not, it's not the old modernization literature. I'm talking about Ron Englehart and Pippa Norris, if you're familiar with them. They, they simply uh, say that there's, there are values that start to become more important as countries develop economically. And a lot of those are things like freedom of expression. That becomes more and more important. And so people start to discuss rights when they have the ability to, right? When they have more resources that they're trying to protect from government corruption and things of this nature, they start to care more about freedom of association, expression, freedom from coercion. Those things become more and more important and then rights discourse spreads. And finally, work in social movements in contentious politics tells us that people seek rights when they're fighting against coercion, right? when they're being repressed or oppressed. And it's a cycle. And so how do we bring all this together? We bring it together by doing what academics sometimes do, oversimplifying a bit. And so we have two basic theoretical models that we've constructed. Uh, one draws on this materialist or realist tradition that, that thinks about the spread of the human rights discourse around the world as something that is produced in the global north, and then it, it, that's the hub, and it spreads out down spokes into the global south and the, or the peripheries. So you can think of the core periphery terminology from international relations on, on this question, but this really treats human rights as sort of exogenous from the outside coming in. And you can see this in this quote from Kostas Duzinas, which is, social and political systems become hegemonic by turning their ideological priorities into universal principles and values. In the new world order, human rights are the perfect candidate for this role. Their core principles, interpreted negatively and economically, promote neoliberal capitalist domination, period. They come from the outside, they promote do the domination of the neoliberal world order. On the other side, you have this idea that human rights kind of come up from the bottom, right? That it's about uh, the promotion uh, that's done by norm entrepreneurs, that uh, people within states or within countries that have an issue reach out to the outside and they say, what tools do we have to work against uh, rapacious government officials and other people that are making our life more difficult? Right? And that in this bottom-up process, which is endogenous, it, they, they enter into what's a global movement that has solidarity attached to it. So, 
Uh, you can see this in a quotation from Neil Stammers. Since the end of the Second World War, a wide range of social movements have sought to challenge existing forms of power. Indeed, in the previous 60 years, it was the oppressed of the world, mobilized in and through social movements, who were the hidden authors of developments in human rights. Human rights don't come from the hegemonic center and spread to the rest of the world necessarily in that fashion. It's not hierarchic. What it is is that there are hidden authors all over the world, and together their efforts build a global movement. You can see that these are two completely different ways of conceptualizing the discourse. And we call these, we get a lot of pushback on what we call these, okay? And reviewers of the, at the APSR didn't let us call the first model what I'm going to call it right now, but call it the imposition and emergence models. The article doesn't say imposition because a reviewer made us get rid of that word. But I stick by it. Okay. Um, the imposition model says it, outsiders bring it in and impose it uncomfortably on local populations. Whereas the emergence model says it comes from the bottom up from local populations and they reach out and make connections to other movements that look similar. You see the difference and it's very clear in these quotations. So we formalize, we formalize these theories and then attach hypotheses to them. So we're empiricists. We try to draw on information that's available to us to reach conclusions, to test hypotheses. And so our hypotheses <coughs> that emanate from excuse me, the imposition model are three. <coughs> One of them is that the human rights discourse spreads as an extension of the efforts of human rights NGOs, non-governmental organizations that are transnational, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and many others. Right, so populations in countries with more human rights, non-governmental organizations that are operating and that have connections to right, uh, transnationals will show greater interest in human rights because the NGOs are introducing the discourse to the people, as Harry England would claim in, in his book on, on, uh, on Sub-Saharan Africa. Another argument is that it comes in the form of foreign direct investment. What sometimes happens is that states offer, states engage or allow firms to engage in foreign direct investment in, in other states, but they impose a number of conditions. There's that impose link. They attach a lot of conditions. And they say, if you're going to engage in FDI, you've got to improve labor rights. You've got to improve civil rights. We have to know that you're not going to expropriate all the land. Things have to, you have to have some judici judicial independence or functioning judiciary to make this relationship work. And in that process, they might be introducing a discourse of rights. Okay? And so populations in countries with greater inflows of FDI might show a greater interest in human rights as well, if that's the vector, right? If it's coming from, through investors and the governments that are protecting them. And then there's a legal hypothesis uh, that human rights agreements might themselves, the law of human rights, spread the discourse. So populations of countries with more commitments to international human rights agreements might show greater interest in human rights because there's this vernacularization of the law that happens. The, the country may, or the state makes a commitment to a human rights treaty. It ratifies or accedes to uh, a human rights agreement. And in that process, there's a negotiation that takes place between social movements and the international legal apparatus. And that builds the discourse of human rights locally. But it's still coming from the outside because these are international agreements. So all of these might be vectors of imposition from the outside to the inside. On the other side, we have the emergence model, which is there are really just two hypotheses. The first is that economic development brings interested rights. So populations of countries experiencing sustained economic growth might show greater interest in human rights. And it's because they have new pockets of wealth that they're trying to mobilize the discourse to protect. Okay, that's a, and they, they also have values that change that attend to new pockets of wealth as well. So there's a lot of work in comparative studies about, or comparative politics about this. It comes from people like 
uh, Ansel and Samuels, and like I mentioned before, Ron Engelhardt. The resistance hypothesis is that populations in countries with more human rights violations should show a higher interest in human rights. Where people are experiencing violence and abuses to physical integrity, there is going to be more interest in the, the language of human rights. Okay, because it exists in a cyclical process. People are responding to violence with mobilization. So these are all of the hypotheses that we're attempting to test. But we have to solve this methodological challenge, which is how do we actually measure where the language of human rights is being mobilized or resonates with the local population. So how can we possibly test these hypotheses? We have to generate a, re a reliable indicator of human rights resonance or human rights interest, more specifically, across contexts. One way of doing this is to do a boatload of surveys. You could survey uh, members of many different populations. And the, the work that's tried to do this the most extensively and impressively so is James Ron, Shannon Golden, David Crow, Archana Pandya's Taking Root, which surveys 13, over 13,000 respondents in Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, Nigeria, Morocco, and India, asking them questions about how much they've used, uh, they're familiar with human rights activism, do they know a human rights organization, do they trust human rights organizations, etc. Right? And then they draw inferences based on the, respond, the responses to those surveys. So this is impressive work. It's hard to field surveys that have 13,000 responses across six countries. Very impressive. But there are drawbacks to survey research. We do survey research, so I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying there are drawbacks to it. One is that you can't really model change over time unless you continue to go back to the same populations and ask them questions in different time periods which they're unable to do because it's very resource intensive. So you can't, you can't see that, that temporal aspect of human rights resonance this way. Um, and we also don't know if they really capture people's everyday interests, right? What happens when you survey? You go, you have questions, and then you ask them to people. But in that process, you might be introducing the concepts to the people in the first place. You can't know if the people are thinking about the, you know, especially if you're getting a representative sample, you can't know that the people might have been thinking about, I've surveyed about the International Criminal Court. Were they thinking about the International Criminal Court before I asked them this question? There's always that inkling of doubt that I'm introducing this to them in the first instance, which means I'm changing the very thing that I'm meant to be studying. Right? It's an observer phenomenon. And surveys can't really get away from this problem. So our idea is to bypass surveys altogether. We actually are planning to do a survey in Guatemala that I'll talk about uh, to, to validate some of this. Uh, because we still think that surveys are useful, but they have to, they, they have to be um, very well designed and with a, a, a very specific purpose in mind. So our idea instead is to measure discursive resonance with aggregate Google search data for the term human rights. So this was the harebrained idea that I invited Chris down in New Orleans to talk to him about. Is I think that we could just study Google aggregate trends data to get leverage on the question of rights resonance. And he was like, no. <laughs> uh, but as he started looking at the API, which is what's under the hood, what, you know, where the data lie behind the interface that you see. For Google Trends, which tells you the trends and what people are searching around the world in ways that you can, you can tailor your search to look at specific populations, regional variations, where the municipalities even in various countries where people are doing certain searches. Right? Fascinating stuff. They give you a great deal of data. When you started plugging into the API behind this, saw that there's a, lot, uh, there's a lot here that we can work with. And so that's what we've used to create our measures. And people think a variety of things about this project. Uh, some people see a lot of promise in it. Some people are highly skeptical, and I'm fine with that. 
right? Uh, but the very first thing they say is, well, not everybody uses Google. That's the first thing that you're wrong about. If you're interested in a subject, what do you do? The answer to this question around the world in 98% of cases is that people go and do a Google search of it, right? You might use Bing or DuckDuckGo, but you would be in the very small minority around the world of people that use those alternatives. Google is a monopoly, which isn't necessarily a good thing, right? We don't support Google's monopoly on search engines uh, and search engine work, but it's useful for us as researchers because we know that people are using Google literally everywhere. And so, this is the first assumption is that people around the world are using Google and we know that they are because there's evidence of that. But we make other assumptions too. These are our four assumptions. For our project, for, the, for this particular project to work, all these assumptions have to hold. So if you have questions or you think that any of these are problematic, it may, might take down the whole thing. And that's fine. Right? But the first is that individuals in a population receive cues or experience or have experiences that spark their interest in human rights. They get interested in human rights for some reason. Okay? And that's based on their individual experiences. Then they turn to the internet in private, often, maybe with another person by their side, but who's, who does internet searches with a, a big group? Sometimes people do, but usually it's in private. They turn in private to the internet to privately, or I've said private too much, to seek information. They're seeking information on the internet based on the cues that have sparked their interests. Whatever that interest is in, people are interested in a wide variety of things, of course. When they search on the internet, they use Google, which I've already argued that they do to the clip of about 98% around the world. And they key in human rights, I'm missing a, an open quotation mark, sorry. They key in human rights to begin learning or discovering resources that respond to the experience that they've had. These are our four assumptions. And these are the assumptions that we make to argue that this is a good measure for interest and resonance of the discourse because people are doing this on their own without survey, survey researchers' provocations. You know, we're not imposing this information on anyone. They are in the privacy of their own home searching for these data because they have a need to. And that's it. If you agree with these four things or think that they sound plausible, then Google Trends data is a good measure of, his, of human rights residents. So that's something that I anticipate we'll talk more about. Google Trends have other advantages. Yeah, go ahead. How have you um, dealt with issues of language? I, I'll get to it. We have okay. five language models. So okay. we, we, have, we, we study variations in five different language groups, but okay. we can't do every language of the world because not every language of the world is spoken across countries, which means that we can't gain comparative leverage mm -hmm. unless we use languages that are spoken across many countries, which we'll talk more about in a, in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. Did somebody else? Yeah. Um, I have a question about uh, you. This was an earlier assumption you talked about, and one of the things you said is it sounded like you were talking about space and population as synonymous. So if you see spatial interest in human rights, that means the population itself is, and yeah. you homogenize that population. And so I'm just wondering about like spatially diffused populations, like uh, I mean, like trans people or LGBTQ people, where generally are like global minorities spatially diffused. But that population in general seems to have more of an interest in human rights or based on the that's a, that's a really good question, and I would, I would flip it to say we might be able to study spatially diffused populations with Google Trends because we could see the parts of the world where people are searching for the same subject, and so it might give you an, a, a, a way of mapping that. Where are people interested in trans rights more than in other places, and then why? Are, they, are is there a solidarity between those communities? Are they talking to each other, etc.? Uh, that's not something we impose political boundaries on on these data uh, by country, but you don't have to. You can you can mix and match 
Uh, and bin populations however you choose to using Google Translator, which is why it's so powerful. And I wonder if it'll always be available to us because it's very powerful. Um, so Google Trends allow us for uh, allows for us to study different levels of analysis. So we can look at the city level, the region level, the country level, the global level. Right? Um, and it also allows us to see trends over time. And we think capture the private interests of individuals. So yeah. Sorry. I you talk about resonance. Uh huh. What do you mean exactly by that? Yeah, resonance is uh, we actually define in the political science paper, but it means that there's uptake of a vocabulary. So people use a vocabulary to articulate claims. Okay, because interest interest in searching for something doesn't mean it appeals to. Right. That's right. We can't say, that's why we kind of back off of resonance a little yeah. and say that it's interest in human rights, because we can measure interest, right. but we can't necessarily measure whether people are using it to mobilize or if it's something else that's going on. You're right about that. So we do, so to operationalize search, we, we have to use a measure that's called search rates. Uh, and it's not raw search totals because Google doesn't give you raw search totals. You can't know how many people typed in human rights in a given place. They won't give you that because then you could reverse engineer the Google algorithm and form an alternative version of it and, and steal their market share. So they only give you proportions. Okay, so this, this is often befuddling, and I understand that, but what, what it is is a search rate is the ratio of a population searches for human rights. So this is a human rights search rate. You could do search rates for other terms too. The ratio of a population searches for human rights to the population's total searches. It's a percentage. It's a per capita measure, which includes then in the denominator the number of people in the population because that's gonna drive the total number of searches in part. And so you take that ratio and then you make that a proportion of the same ratio in other countries or other defined populations, and then you have proportions of proportions. So if you know, for example, that there were 60 out of 100 searches in Colombia, let's say, that's 60%, right? And you compare that to maybe 30% in El Salvador, and then you, you say that there's been two times as much searching in Colombia as in El Salvador. That's what we do with the search rates data. So for our main political science paper, we started with weekly search rates across, all, uh, across countries in five different language groups over a five-year period. It works best if you do a five-year period instead of a longer period because of restrictions that Google places on the data. I can talk about that later. But we choose English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Arabic, and use common translations of the term human rights. And we ask native speakers to provide us all of the available translations and, and walk us through what different choices we might make. And then we worked on the models uh, here. But the, these are languages that are spoken across many countries so we can gain comparative leverage. And then we put them all into the same model with something that's called a fixed effects parameter, which I guarantee you're not interested in, but I can explain it if you want to know how we do a model of all the countries, even though they speak different languages. What do the Google Trends show? Let's get to the heart of the matter. Search queries for the term human rights occur at a relatively high rate compared to other search terms of similar political importance or conceptual content. So you might think, Karen Engel argues that we should move away from human rights and instead adopt a vocabulary of social justice for social movements because that would be a more productive discourse. But we can actually look and see how resonant social justice is compared to human rights across the world using these data. And the answer is it doesn't even get close to the amount that human rights is searched or the amount that people are using this term. So we can look at human rights versus other queries. We can start with a, a blank uh, canvas. Uh, we might study the how much people type in war versus human rights. And the purple is always higher. This is war. This is human rights. War is searched way more than human rights, which we might expect. Civil war is a bit closer. Okay. 
This is human rights and something that's not that related, which is malaria. And we did this because these are these these two terms are the closest to each other in a trend. Malaria, people care about human rights as much as they care about malaria around the world. And they care about malaria a lot because malaria is still deadly and it still affect it, it, it sickens a great number of people around the world. And where there's more malaria, people search more for malaria, which helps validate our method, right? Because we assume that where people are interested in something, they're searching for it on Google. Human rights is searched more than torture. Human rights is searched more than terrorism, which might surprise you. Human rights, it surprised me. Human rights is searched more than national security, the phrase, which really surprised me. And human rights is searched four or five times more than social justice. So social justice is way down here, human rights is up here. Okay, so human rights is a very used phrase. And that helps us when we're trying to compare across places. You might wonder, what are they getting when they search for human rights, or what else are they looking for? This is, these are what are called co-occurring terms. Human Rights Watch, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, U European Court of Human Rights. What is human rights? This is information seeking about the concept and institutions and advocacy organizations. That's what we usually see attend to. So you might say, what if people are searching human rights because they don't like them, right? Well, we would see more co-occurring terms that are things like human rights and hypocrisy, maybe, or human rights uh, fa have failed, maybe. Uh, and we don't see a lot of instances of that in uh, co-occurring search terms. What about global trends over time? Are people losing interest in human rights? This is what it looks like over this five-year period. And we do it in five-year period starting in 2013 when Hopgood made his argument. So 2013 through 17, 2014 through 18, and so on. But I'm just presenting you the one from 2018 through 2022. And there's basically a flat line with a slight step up in 2022. Interest is not ascending at a great clip, but it's also not declining. It's saying about the same around the world. And you can see this when we break it into different language groups. Okay, so Spanish, it's getting, it's increasing slightly. Portuguese is saying flat, it's kind of a U shape. Arabic, also flat. French, very flat. Okay, people are just as interested in human rights in 2022 and I think we've updated these to 2023 now, and 10 years before. Yes? I, I th like, I'm just curious, like the increase in like 2022, like did you find anything related to COVID-19? It, it might be, but we would expect that I think to happen when the COVID outbreak first occurred, if that were the explanation. Uh, so we're not quite sure yet. You, you, you really have to, um, what you have to do is you have to look at spikes that are around certain news events. So in 2018, there was a spike, and it was when uh, the news of the family separations of the U.S. southern border hit the, the news cycle. People were searching human rights more in that summer than any other period that we've observed. And so we could sometimes, but I don't know what happened in 2022 yet. What about variations across countries? And this is, I think, where it gets super interesting and unexpected, okay? Let's start in English. Where do people search the most for human rights? The darker countries are, show higher search activities. Here, Sub-Saharan Africa. What are the top searching countries that we see? Zambia, Zimbabwe, Uganda. That's where people, as a proportion of all their searches, search the most for human rights, right? Followed by South Africa, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Let's, let's uh, look at all of the English speaking countries or at least the top 36. So we've got, uh, sorry, the order switched a little bit. This is a slightly older chart, but basically the same information. Zambia, Zimbabwe, Uganda, South Africa, Canada 16th, Britain is 20th, the U.S. is 28th, low on the list of places where people show high interest in human rights.
and sustained interest in human rights, at least as evidenced by their internet search activity. Usually when we go in to a talk, Chris and I, when we do the tandem thing, we'll be like, where do you think people search the most for human rights? And inevitably people say Britain, France, the US, and, and we're, they're wrong in every single instance. Right? This is Spanish. Where is it concentrated? Central America, and specifically the Triangle, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras. So Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras are the top three. In Argentina, which my advisor and colleague, Kevin Recipient, called the global protagonist of human rights, is down in 12th spot. Right, or wait, yeah, 12th. So this is fascinating. We see this pattern recur in Portuguese, French, and Arabic. Cape Verde and Mozambique are the leaders in Portuguese, Burundi, and Gabon in French, and Palestine, Morocco, and Arabic. So our findings so far, interest in human rights seems to be high compared to other political concepts, and we can talk more about that. Interest in human rights is stable, and interest is more concentrated in the global south than it is in the global north. Which I think upends a lot of people's expectations, especially those that think that the discourse is imposed from the outside. But part six, and this is the final bit, is what explains human rights interest itself? Where does it emerge and why? Why does it emerge in these places that we see on the maps? So I told you we had the imposition of emergence and emergence models, and they had different hypotheses. So we use different measures of these things. We also include a measure of the state, which is internet censorship. Because presumably, where the internet is filtered, people will search for human rights less or be less able to search for human rights on Google, like in China. This is the China problem. So the dependent variable are these search rates. These are our independent variables in our models. And this is what it turns up. So this is a coefficient plot. Don't worry about too much about it. I'll just break it down. The problem of internet censorship is real. If it's on the left side of this line, it means, and, and these lines aren't touching, it means that it's statistically significant and is, it predicts less searching. So internet censorship produces less searching for human rights in countries. The imposition model doesn't perform very well. This is the NGO's hypothesis. This is FDI. This is human rights treaty ratifications, all of which, by and large, are not very much associated with human rights searching. And we tried different measures of this. Chris scraped all of Amnesty International's, like, its entire website for all of the written information it's ever produced. And we use that as an alternative measure. And it's also not associated with human rights searching. So if Amnesty International is publishing a bunch of information about countries, does that inspire people in the country to search for human rights? No. The emergence hypotheses are supported. GDP growth and then this, human rights violations, are the predictors of where we're going to see more searching for human rights and, and arguably more resonance of the discourse. And human rights violations is by far the most, the, the most robust or strongest predictor. So the takeaway is that the discourse of human rights isn't really going away, and it's highest where government violence is high. Right? And people are seeking information about what to do to respond to that problem. The problem of repression, the problem of oppression. And so our takeaway is that people mobilize the language or they show the highest interest in the language of human rights where it's needed most. Are they being provided human rights in those places? Is the international system and its set of laws and institutions responding to them? Well, that's a separate question, but they're most interested where they're facing human rights crises. So what? This is a Reddit channel about this paper, <laughs> which I didn't even know, I didn't know that could be a thing. This is, what, this is what people said. You mean people are more interested in human rights in areas where there are likely to be fewer? Why is that surprising? 
This is in no way surprising. Researchers also found greatest interest in water in the middle of the desert. Right? <laughs> Normal people, this is hilarious to me. Normal people don't think that this is surprising. Think this is like just academics proving something that we already understand. But that is really interesting to me because that's not what academics of human rights say. They say it's all drying up. People aren't interested in human rights anymore, and they're all seemingly wrong about that. And, and what they're saying really doesn't resonate with ordinary people, especially ordinary Redditors. <laughs> so, in sum, the critique of human rights and the, and the idea that it's imposed from the outside and that it doesn't reach ordinary people might be more Western an academic than the human rights discourse itself. And on that provocative note, I'll open it to questions. I know some people need to leave, so feel free to, to uh, go out. Um, also, just want to say during this q and if you want coffee, cookies, food, over there, just get up and get some, please. Um, but now, let's open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm really interested in the data on the Northern Triangle, so uh, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. Um, and I'm wondering if there's been any accounting for, for example, low literacy rates, particularly amongst the older population that would be more politically active, but like less, less likely to have um, the ability to read and, and, less likely, uh, and less likely to engage in Google searches, like might not have phones, for example, which leads to then an, a question about the digital divide, which I imagine you considered in some way. So, you know, this is capturing some really interesting and surprising data, yeah. but I'm wondering, you know, what the social movement literature, for example, might be able to tell you about the people who are kind of outside of these um, these parameters. Yeah, so, I mean, if people aren't using their phones to search the internet and they're not using a desktop or a laptop to search the internet, then they're outside of our study. You know, we can't reach those folks. Um, which is why I think Guatemala is a particularly interesting case because we see a great deal of activity in places you wouldn't expect in Guatemala. So. Searches for human rights are, I mean, are high in Guatemala in general. Um, and we search for other evidence of what's going on in this country. So the first thing that we ask, let me see if there's a, is where are they doing the searches? And it's not in Guatemala City. It's in the middle of the country. Okay, these are, the Alta Verapaz and uh, Weiwei Tenango are the, are the um, they're not provinces, departments where there's the most searching. Okay, so it's not in the capital of the country and where elites are in the country. You know, though, though of course the elites are spread through the country, but not where we would think. You know, not um, in, in the main urban areas of Guatemala. What else do we see about Guatemala is that there's high concern for rights in general and freedom of expression in Guatemala compared to other countries. And this comes from uh, Latin American population surveys from 2016. Um, so this is the best that we can find on this, but this is a high salience issue in Guatemala compared to other states like Argentina, which also surprises. us. Um, how much do they use the internet more than other countries? Uh, this is internet as a source of information. Guatemala is one of the highest. And then online searching for in information about politics and political event, also the highest. Is that, I think that's, I, I didn't expect that either, um, but this, they're highest on both of these dimensions. So people in Guatemala are searching the internet for political news and information, um, which fits together with our understanding of what's happening around human rights. They're searching for human rights, too. Um, so one of the things that we want to do is validate a lot of this by surveying in Guatemala and asking people across different age cohorts about their use of the internet, what they're searching for, in a way that sort of replicates this, but with more information that's directly relevant to human rights mobilization. And just my follow-up question, or maybe a comment, is um, to what degree the, the, the high search areas um, 
to, to what to, to what proximity do they have to mega projects to um, Canadian mines, for example? Um, is there any relationship there? Would be That's a good question. I, I, I we could only know that by uh, doing kind of like some GIS work, which we could do by breaking the country down into municipalities and and seeing where the searches are highest within the country, and then geolocating some of those projects. But I think what it's associated with is indigenous movements. Um, and, and indigenous movements and also movements for justice for violence during the Civil War, which often work together. But I think that those are what's driving the results in Guatemala. Um, that's, my, that's my speculation. It's a hypothesis that needs to be tested. Very interesting. Yeah? My question would be, how in the first place did uh, the academics think differently from simple people about, the, about the, the human rights and how one side thought that they were disappearing when the simple people thought that the, the remains an issue? Yeah, I mean, I, this is something that we all struggle with. And I'm not, I'm not, it, it's, it's difficult to say that all academics are wrong. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, but, and, and I think that a lot of their intuitions are right. Like, there, there, there is a concern for human rights that's even spread among ordinary people. Like, all this, uh, th this resource for us might one day go away. You know, and there's an anxiety, I think, is the best way of capturing it. And academics pick up on that anxiety, you know, uh, by talking to people. But what they're doing is, they're doing what we all do. They're gathering their impressions and then drawing inferences based on their impressions. But what are where where from where does Stephen Hopgood and, or, or Sam Moyne get their impressions? You know, Stephen Hopgood works at, in London. He 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 advocated with Amnesty International. He's a friend of mine. I consider him a friend. So I'm not like I'm not we're not mad at each other. But he gets his impressions from a university in London. Where does Sam Moyne get his impressions from? From Yale. All right, how much talking are they doing to people in Uganda? I don't know, but it might be that it's not enough, or it might be that those impressions don't represent those populations, in that they, in trying to represent the interests of people that they care deeply about, like Hopgood is, is he, he, he's a, a poet almost, and, and very much cares about people, uh, but he, um, he's, he's not necessarily, in trying to be a representative of of folks from around the world, he might be committing this the same fallacies that we all commit of, of attempting to represent when we don't represent. Um, so there's a representation problem here too. Sort of piggyback off of that comment. <clears throat> there's been so much critique of human rights discourse, you know, connecting it with the Enlightenment and all the other critiques of the Enlightenment connecting it with neoliberalism, as you said. And in light of the data you're presenting, I think the, the question that I'll be left with is whether or not it is scholars who have gotten this so wrong, who have been so invested in these critiques of these discourses, that they are actually the ones doing the work of neoliberal states by by you know, delegitimating human rights discourse. Yeah, <laughs> you know I, I I'm hesitant because it's a big claim, but I, there there's something in it. You know it, what what often happens with uh, kind of arch critics of the discourse is that they end up fi finding allies in authoritarian regimes that uh, they say see. You see what the problem with human rights is? It perpetuates Western dominance, et cetera, et cetera. So we should stop caring about it. And then human rights advocates on the ground, no, 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 uh, don't do that. You know, don't. and this is a this is from the playbook that's used in like in places that I've studied, Sri Lanka, Kenya. They often <coughs> draw on the Western critics of human rights to attack the human rights movement within their own countries. And then I, I once was meeting with an advocate in Sri Lanka, and she said, no, Sri Lanka needs the Enlightenment. <laughs> and I didn't tell, I, you know, I wasn't even talking about the Enlightenment. She, she just offered that. And I thought that, that was really pretty fascinating. You know, um, 
And so they don't need a critique of the Enlightenment advocates there. They need enlightened thinking. They, they want human rights, you know, and they want the protections of human rights. And so maybe it, it might be that that intuition that, that the academics and the elites that are criticizing the discourse are themselves, it's a, it, that's, it's, that itself is quite Western and foreign to local populations that we care about. No, we'll come back over here, yeah, sorry. Uh, can you use this methodology to look at covariation? Like whether human rights is covariating, it's appearing with other terms? Oh, yeah. So have you done that? Yeah, so that's what we do with malaria, for example. Uh, we said what, what, what other searching follows the same pattern as human rights? Yeah, I'm thinking more of the you're searching for human rights and indigenous. And, yeah, so that's what, that's what are called co-occurring terms. And so we have the information on co-occurring terms. And what you do is you, you access the API for Google Trends. And you say, like, in, in what searches are human rights the phrase, or in, sorry, human rights the phrase, in what terms, larger terms, is it embedded? And what terms is it searched with? And so this is what we usually turn up. This kind of, and in other languages, it looks the same. And often it's like, it's searching for the local human rights institution, the, the national human rights institution in the country, uh, because people are trying to reach the institutions that are meant to protect human rights, or they're seeking information. What rights do I have? Right? Uh, what is this universal declaration that I've heard people talk about? Uh, the Human Rights Commission here. And then they'll search it with the UN, because they know about the UN. So this is, these are these are global co-occurring terms, but we can also look at the co-occurring terms by population as we define them. Or you could look for specific co-occurring terms, like human rights in particular groups. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, we can we can burrow in, and one of the things that we're interested in is trying to figure out which rights people are interested in in different places. So it might be that. Uh, you know, folks in Guatemala and El Salvador are searching more for human rights, but are they looking for different rights content? And that's a little harder to answer, but we there are tools that we can use to do that. Um, so my Yeah, so what are, what's the hypothesis about this? So talk, let's say we're talking about internet penetration is usually the term that's used, but it all, you might also be talking about not just the use of the internet in the whole population, but its use across the population that we've defined. So in a country, let's say. Uh, so what is the hypothesis that you have about that? Yeah, so we don't, there, we don't have, I don't, I don't think we need to deal with it in this instance because it's all part of the denominator. So if you're saying that the internet hasn't penetrated in a country as much, then they will just have fewer searches for everything. And then human rights will be a proportion of those, that smaller number of searches compared to places where the internet is less used. And so the, the proportion isn't affected because it just changes what the information in the denominator. But it might be that there's, there are other questions about whether internet penetration itself drives searching. If it does, then there, might, there could be error in this measure. But I don't think that it does because we've looked at internet penetration data and studied whether it's correlated with the proportions and it's not, which it, it should be. Yeah. yeah. I just want to follow up on a question. So I'm thinking about events like the Arab Spring when the internet uh -huh. was turned off. So I'm wondering after such an event, will there be an uptick in search for human rights? And what might you see from moments of turning off the internet to turning on the search? Yeah, so I mean, if, if the internet's turned off, then for that week or for that month, whatever the spell, however long it lasts, it's going to plummet to zero, right? Um, 
Or my question is more with such an event we see as a prompt to search for more human rights afterwards. In other words, is that seen as a sort of violation? Oh, I see. Yeah, I think so. I think when that's a good question and that we could look at with data more specifically. I hadn't thought about that. But I think that we would expect to, for when the internet returns, for there to be more searching than was before. But maybe not because people are scared. So you can see it cutting in two different ways. Like they know that if they search for the for human rights after there's been a blackout, that there's probably still filtering and censorship that's going on. So they need to be careful for a while. But it still should be it should increase over time as they stop worrying about that as much. That's a, that's guesswork. We could test that, you know. And I think that's interesting. Uh, did you, sorry, did you have another one or? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, it's not a fully informed thought, but I was just thinking that you, you referred to that shortly, that uh, a lot of people search this way in the privacy of their own home uh -huh. or uh, by using their own device. So whatever they find is, I, I don't want to go into that, but how do you bring out this information into the real world at, uh, at the times we're living with political correctness and all? Because I feel, do you feel that political correctness can facilitate this kind of discussion about human rights or what do you what, what do you mean like how uh, how how would uh, the research interact with norms yes, of political how do correctness? you bring the research out into the world how how do you uh, how do you show to the people what do you have found in oh. terms of political correctness when you cannot identify? like are we worried that people will react negatively to the findings do you mean or yeah i mean Human rights are a broad term, but I, I was mostly thinking about identity. So how how do you how do you measure actually what part of human rights people are mostly concerned? Oh about? right, yeah. So to do that, we have to uh, we have to come up with a dictionary of terms that uh, attend to human rights or that would would fill in the the broad content. So you might. We need to look at social rights. We need to look at economic rights. We need to look at uh, various types of physical integrity violations, and then, and then build that dictionary out and do the same analysis for every single term, uh, you know, and see where there's more interest in various types of rights across countries. The problem is that a lot of the other terms are searched far less, um, except for torture. But torture, unfortunately, that it's not people that are. It's not only people that are searching for the right not to be tortured, they're searching for torture itself. Uh, and there's, so there's a great many people that search for that and they're not looking for human rights content, they're looking for torture content, which is pretty sinister. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I am really interested in the methodology. It's really interesting. My question is in terms of the lower ranking of like Canada and US like I think it's very surprising so do you have any opinion on that because like in Canada and US there are like more groups more diversity from different uh, identities and stuff so any thoughts on like why there is no ranking yeah there, there are two speculations that we have about that one is that there, there's such a wide there's such a wide diversity in interests in those countries among all of the people, and these are big countries, so there's a lot of people and they're searching for all kinds of stuff, Taylor Swift, the Kardashians, et cetera, et cetera, and they have like limitless access to the internet at the same time. So human rights as a proportion of all of those searches is going to be less. But also, we know that occasionally like spikes of interest in human rights in those countries drives global interest in the data. So sometimes people get interested in human rights in the US, like with the separation at the Southern Board, the family separation policy, and other things that happen that it, it blows the chart through the roof, right? So we know that people occasionally get interested in human rights in those countries. So what's really happening is that there's not sustained interest in those places. Those are places have short attention spans on the internet which doesn't surprise anyone, right? Uh, people are searching for all kinds of stuff and they might be searching for human rights one day and then they've moved on the next day to something else. Um, whereas I think in other 
populations that we're interested in, there's more of a sustained interest, and there's there's more regular activity that's uh, you know human rights related. Thank you. Yeah, I want to just balance on the question that you had. In a lot of these places that have the the internet blackouts, oh, many will turn to VPNs and uh, to differentiate their ISPs. I was wondering if this is kind of like a place that. Is this something that is considered, or a place that, like even searching of VPNs, that we we might be able to see that there's people trying to move, like move around kind of these blockages? Yeah. So th there's some evidence of that, and, and the best evidence that we have that that happens is uh, when we look at the models for for Mandarin or Cantonese. Uh, the there's uh, it doesn't show us much because those languages are mainly spoken in mainland China and then um, uh, Malaysia and and then we see a lot of searches in the United States and the United States are immigrant populations but also people that are VPNing through the US and so that just shows us the way that they get around the filtering but we can't really talk about comparative evidence that much because we we can't distinguish what's being searched through VPNs from regular searches in a population Exists, the, the politics one. What's that? The APS. There's an APSR paper. Yeah, it's an APSR. It's so it's a, it's one of those like online first, and it'll oh. it'll be in the print in like ten years Good. or something. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering about um, what the next step is in thinking about uh, causation here. Because let's say, suppose I'm not a number cruncher, I'm a political theorist. So just uh, if we accept your conclusion that the discourse is not imposed from the outside. Question is what explains the mass appeal of human rights, and um, came up with something like the habits of countries for human rights violations show higher interest in human rights. And, uh, initially, when you said that, like, initially, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> just like the editors, yeah. my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I thought um, that, and so in the context of the way you present the very nicely the, the two different options, the imposition top-down versus the emergence bottom-up uh, uh, models, that as far as the discourse goes, suppose for the sake of argument that you are right, that the discourse, uh, the evidence shows that the bottom-up emergence model is the one that does the explaining. But then the question is, you know, why, why are people looking up human rights in Guatemala and doing edits on Because their government is repressing them killing people, arresting them, and imprisoning them without trial, and so torturing them, and so on. Um, so I might be you know, less concerned with, with what the language is being used. Yeah, human rights is a good language to express uh, resistance to such state behavior. Then the question is, what's causing the interest? The causing the interest is how their government is behaving. And how is their, why is their government behaving? You know, what, what is necessary for the government to be behaving in this way? Well, one. One significant part of the explanation might be not what's going on purely domestically, but in fact externally, namely not foreign direct investment, but foreign military aid, foreign right. aid to countries. Um, you know, we said, what was it, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras. So when I was an undergraduate, yeah, this is where the United States was, you know, in instrumental in you know, hundreds of thousands of, of deaths uh, by supporting these tyrannical governments. Go on the right. You can now. What, what I'm thinking of is just like the the, the, ca the causal story, not just the language of human rights, but interest in the subject is sure domestic, but the cause ultimately is yeah, it's an still, element of of, yeah, of international relations and especially powerful countries uh, propping up human rights violating regimes. Yeah, insofar as countries. Uh, yeah, the, the, this exogenous, what you're pointing to is that there's like kind of an indirect relationship between U.S. hegemony and local interests in human rights. So it could be that there's not a direct promotional aspect or a, di a promotional vector that says like U.S. foreign policy itself is spreading the discourse. But you, 
like by, by saying you should care about human rights. But what's happening is by supporting the very regimes that are committing human rights violations, they're generating an interest in human rights indirectly. Right? Um, and that's really interesting. I hadn't really thought to test that empirically. Um, I think the theoretical implication that we're driving at and moving towards is that this talk of kind of scrapping the language and just moving on from it or, um, or embracing a different language of activism or solidarity around the world is kind of an unrealistic and maybe not a helpful proposition. And people do actually make that proposition right now. And so instead of saying, we should be moving on from the language, let's scrap it, let's embrace the language, stick with it, and then use this kind of a thing as a, as a, like, as a measure for where people need support, right? Uh, it's, it's like responding with health interventions where there's malaria and people are searching for the symptoms, where people are searching for human rights where they know that there's a problem. So that's where we should be supporting. And so if the problem is that the US is providing hundreds of millions of dollars of military aid in that country, then that's something that we need to work on. Because that's what's leading, ultimately leading to the surges. Right? But, but all the talk of the language isn't helpful to people, they don't, they don't find it uh, particularly useful, all that stuff needs to, we need to move on from that. And the, the, what people have referred to as endism, Right? Um, you can't just wholesale change discourses. Uh, and so we need to use the tools at our disposal to, to help where we're able to. And I think that that's what we're kind of pushing towards. And so, so yeah, if the problem is America, then something needs to be done. I think we've come, oh, sorry. Did you just ask a curiosity question. So you've got some of the, I guess, the most frequent search terms here. Yeah, co-occurring terms. terms. Yeah. If you go down the list, I'm assuming that there will be quite a few more there. Are there any really surprising combinations that you saw? Not yet. Uh, th there's more to do here, and I think by country. And I think that's when we'll start to turn up interesting things like what... So, so if, we take, if, if we did 192 of these, or 110 of them is probably more, uh, we're probably more able to do, then we might see things pop up and say, we didn't expect that that would be a co-occurring term. This is what's driving the interest in this country, right? I think uh, when we look at Uganda, for example, LGBT laws, that anti-LGBT laws that have been passed is what's driving interest there. And, and that shows up in, in these kinds of charts, but also uh, charts that kind of, we can, we can mark when the law was passed and also when it hit international news and people searching for human rights. And it's pretty clear that that's the relationship there. So, I think that this, there's good comparative work to do here where we just break, we just go country by country and look, but we haven't done that yet. Thank you everyone for coming. Please join me in um, thanking Jeff for this really interesting talk.